This is F43 using autosomal DNA to find cousins and break through brick walls. And our presenter today is Dr. Morris Gleason, a psychiatrist and pharmaceutical physician, as well as a genetic genealogist. He is administrator of several surname DNA projects. He works with adoptees and has appeared on TV as a DNA consultant. He authors several blogs, is a regular contributor to genealogical magazines, and his YouTube videos are very popular. He has organized the DNA lectures for Genetic Genealogy Ireland in Dublin and Who Do You Think You Are in the UK since 2012. He's given talks all over Ireland, the UK, and internationally. He was voted Genetic Genealogist of the Year 2015. Um, Surname DNA Journal and Superstar Genealogist Ireland in 2016, Canada's Anglo Celtic Connections. I'm very pleased to present Dr. Gleason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and um, uh, welcome to the second DNA lecture of this uh, series of lectures today. Um, I'm going to be talking just exclusively about autosomal DNA, which is the main DNA test that most people use for their genealogy, and how we can use it to find cousins, and by finding cousins we can break through brick walls, because what do the cousins have? The family Bible. <laughs> Those letters in the attic from 1860. And a few other bits and pieces that I shall reveal during the course of this presentation. Now, uh, this is being recorded as well for the uh, uh, website uh, so that uh, you can see it again if need be. And I will be going through the entire process, step-by-step -step process that I use for managing your matches, of which there are a huge amount. So I think most people in the room have done a DNA test. Is that correct? Yes? Okay. Who's tested with Ancestry? Quite a few people. Uh, 23 and me. Not quite so much, maybe about 20. Uh, family Tree DNA? about 30, my heritage, about 10, uh, living DNA, about 10 again. Okay, so that gives us an idea of uh, who is tested with which company. And of course, um, there are these, the various companies that do this test. It is the, called the autosomal DNA test, technically. And it tells us about our ethnic makeup, our genetic cousins, our medical risk assessment, if that's what you're interested in, and what percent Neanderthal you are, which is always about 3 to 4%. Uh, I always say you don't need to do a test to find out how much Neanderthal you are. You just ask your wife to look at you on a Saturday morning after a Friday night out, and she will tell you exactly how much Neanderthal you are. <laughs> So the autosomal test goes back about five, six, seven generations to about the level of your four times great, 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 uh, four times great grandparents. And the autosomal DNA consists of this uh, batch of chromosomes here. So chromosomes one up to 22. Uh, it, they also throw in the X chromosome, uh, which is one of the sex chromosomes, which is pair 23. And then you have the mitochondrial DNA down there. And uh, the autosomes account for about 95% of the DNA that you have in every single cell in your body. And that's why it is the most useful for matching you to other people. So when we're talking about these autosomal DNA tests, we're talking about these 22 pairs of chromosomes. Uh, and as I said this morning, usually when, when uh, they, the companies do this test, they throw in the X chromosome for free. So that means if you're a woman and you've got two X chromosomes, you're going to be getting all 46 of your 46 chromosomes as part of the autosomal DNA test. If you're a man, you're only getting 45 out of your 46 chromosomes because men have a Y chromosome. And that Y chromosome is not included in the autosomal DNA test. It's a separate test altogether. So how did you get your DNA? Well, this is where I should really have a diagram of the birds and the bees. But instead, I'm going to imagine that you are this little girl here, and you got half of your 46 chromosomes from your father, from dad. And dad has 46 chromosomes, but those 46 chromosomes, he got half of them from his mother and half of them from his father, which of course would be your grandparents. So in this way, the DNA is getting passed on. And every generation, it's halved and passed on to the child. 
So um, what happens are, are two important biological processes that account for what we see in our DNA results. The first of them is something called recombination or crossing over. And in other words, before a chromosome is passed on, it swaps bits with the other copy of that particular chromosome. So you've got two copies of chromosome one. Before they're passed on, the two copies swap bits from each other. But of course, one copy is from your father. One copy is from your mother. By swapping bits, they're producing a hybrid chromosome one that is then passed on to the child. And that hybrid consists of a little bit of grandpa and a little bit of grandma. But how much of grandpa and grandma is totally up to chance. Uh, the second thing that happens is that, you know, dad has 46 chromosomes. He's only going to pass on 23 to you. So he shuffles his chromosomological cards and he throws half of them away and he only gives you half of his deck. So it means that half of your father's DNA never makes it down to you. And those are two very, very important processes, and that accounts for why we see uh, our DNA as segments. Because when they, that swapping occurs, all the, the, the chromosomes are split up into the little segments, that's where your segments come from, from this crossing over, from this recombination of the maternal and paternal copies of the chromosome, and they're all mixed up together and then passed on. That's how you get your segments. And that happens every single generation. So it happens from grandma, grandpa, down to dad, and it happens from dad down to you. And the end result is that you're only half the woman your father was. <laughs> Think about it. Oh, yeah, because he's half paternal, half maternal. You're only going to get half of the maternal side from your father, half of his maternal, which would have been his mother. So you're only half the woman your father was, in the same way you're only half the man your mother was. So how much DNA do I get from each of my ancestors? If you imagine your four times great grandmother, she passes on half of her DNA to each of her children, and then that is halved again as it comes down to the grandchildren, the great grandchildren, and so on. By the time it reaches me, born around about 1960, I'm only getting about one and a half percent of my great-great-great-great-grandmother's DNA. So the amount of DNA that actually trickles down to the present generations is very, very small when you're talking about 64 four times great-grandparents. How much DNA do I share with my relatives? Well, siblings will share 50%, first cousins 12 and a half, second cousins 3%, then third cousins 0.8, fourth cousins 0.2, fifth cousins 0.05%. It gets really, really small when you get down to the fifth cousin level. And that's why the reach of autosomal DNA is only about 300 years, because beyond that, the DNA that's being passed down is so, so small that a lot of it never trickles through in the first place. So if we look at how many cousins will the, this particular test detect, it will detect about 99% of first and second cousins, 90% of third cousins, only about 50% of fourth cousins, and only about 10% of fifth cousins, because the DNA is simply not trickling down to all of your fifth cousins, only about 10% of your fifth cousins. And if you want to put that in numbers, it means that if we assume that there's three children per generation, then you've got 12 first cousins, and it'll detect all of those, 71 out of 72 second cousins, 390 out of 430 third cousins, 1,300 out of 2,600 fourth cousins, and 1,600 out of 16,000 fifth cousins. So that's why most of our DNA matches are actually distant cousins, because we have so many more fifth, sixth, and seventh cousins than we do second and third cousins. These are the size of the databases currently. We have about 10 million in the Ancestry DNA database, 5 million in the 23andMe, a million in Family Tree DNA, 2 million in MyHeritage, uh, 10,000 or so in Living DNA, and about, well, there's about a million now in GEDmatch. And these are going up all the time, and the real market leader is Ancestry because their growth rate is exponential. 
I used to say we'll have 20 million by 2020. I'm now revising that to 35 million people in these databases by the end of 2020. That's where we're heading for. And it just means that you are going to find in your matches closer and closer and closer matches as time goes on. And we are going to be reconnecting the world in ways we had not imagined. These are my matches on family tree DNA. In the early days, they were 360. Then it went up to 1,013. And now it's about 1,914 matches in the family tree DNA database. And that just goes to show how the database is increasing all the time, and the number of matches is increasing all the time as well. On 23andMe, I had 1,343. Now it's gone up to over 1,400. On Ancestry, it was, it was 10,700. And now it's come down to a sizable 1,435 because they realized nobody can have 10,700 matches and they're all related to, to you. And that's when they discovered there's a lot of false positives creeping in when you get the smaller and smaller segments and the smaller and smaller amounts of DNA shared. A lot of false positives are creeping into the system. So they refined their algorithm, got a lot of what are called got rid of a lot of what are called pile-up regions. And these are regions of our DNA which are more or less essential for survival. So they kind of everybody has them. And even though it does indicate you are related to somebody, it's not a couple of hundred years ago. It's a couple of thousand years ago, probably. And this is places in your DNA like um, the places that code for immunity the immune response against influenza, the HLA antigens. There's certain parts of our DNA that is essential for our survival. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we get these pile-up regions where everybody has the same kind of gene or the same kind of DNA at a particular area on a particular chromosome. So our understanding of these has increased over the, over the course of time. Now you also have GEDmatch as well. I mentioned that this morning. And I have about 2,000 matches on GEDmatch. So when I put all of these together, I have got tens of thousands of matches. So I added them all to my Christmas card list. <laughs> and the, the wrist replacement is working really well. So don't go adding these matches to your Christmas card list, because a lot of them will be false positives. Uh, I mentioned this morning, uh, can you transfer your data? And the answer is very, very much yes, but only from ancestry to family tree DNA, GEDmatch, MyHeritage, and living DNA. Uh, it doesn't allow you to transfer it to 23andMe, because 23andMe uh, has said, no, we're not accepting transfers. If you want to find out uh, who you match in our database, you have to do our test. So it was commercially a commercial move just to make sure that they uh, uh, did well in their business model. Uh, but the most cost-efficient testing strategy is to test with Ancestry. And I see they've got a sale on at the moment for $59. So I just got an email into my inbox. So now is probably a very good time to buy that Ancestry kit. If you do test with Ancestry, it gives you limited access to um, the database. Uh, if you want to get the most out of your Ancestry results, you have to take out a subscription to Ancestry. And that will cost you, what, $300 a year. So, you know, for those of you that don't want to test with Ancestry, then probably testing with the Ancestry DNA test is not the best uh, uh, way forward for you because it means you will not get the maximum out of it. You could test with Family Tree DNA, for example, and then upload to all to MyHeritage, GEDmatch, and Living DNA. It doesn't give you access to the Ancestry DNA database, but it is maybe more cost effective if you don't want to subscribe to Ancestry. Now, that's how to get into the databases. Once you're in the databases, there are two broad ways to approach managing your DNA matches. The first one is you ask a specific question. And it's usually along the lines of, I'm sure we're related to that crowd over there. You know, so I'll get the question, um, I think I'm related to this man, but how do I actually prove that I am? I said, well, you'd have to get him to do the test, and uh, you do the test yourself, and then if you were related, you'd match. Uh, what's the man's name? George Clooney. <laughs> so, OK, <laughs> good luck trying to get DNA from George. Um, so in this sort of situation, you do have to test two people. And I've done this very successfully with uh, 
uh, uh, family in Australia uh, because we found a wedding memento in my great-grandfather's papers which talked about Ruby Kathleen Gleason getting married in Australia in 1893 to David Patterson. And, you know, we had no idea who this person was, uh, and my dad was happy to put her into the shoebox and shove her under the bed. And I said, well, hold on a second there, let me do some investigating. I did, found her grandson who was in his 80s, got him to do a DNA test, he came back as a second cousin match to my dad. And it turned out that his Grand, his grandmother, Ruby Kathleen Gleason, was a sister of my dad's grandfather, and we never knew. They emigrated years and years ago. Um, just recently, I was in Australia. I was able to visit her grave. I am the first relative from Ireland to visit Ruby Kathleen since 1886. Wow. Closure. Very important. So for this specific question, you, just, you need to test two people. It is an excellent way of confirming your tree. How do you know the research you've done is accurate? You assume it is, but isn't there that niggling question in the back of your mind when John Smith, your, your ancestor John Smith, and you found a record for a John Smith, you're not 100% sure that it's the right record for him, but if you actually test somebody who is a descendant of this John Smith record and they match you genetically, that's a very useful way of adding confirmatory evidence to your documentary-based research. So this is a very important approach, the specific question. Uh, most of us, however, just do the fishing trip, and that's where we just throw our DNA into the database and we see what we can catch. And in that situation, only you need to do the test, and then you can compare yourself to the 18 million people in these other databases. So let's look at this fishing trip, as I call it, and how to use a step-by-step -step approach to assess the matches that you get. And these are the three main companies, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, and Ancestry. But my heritage is now uh, gaining in, in numbers, 2 million at this stage. And uh, Living DNA is going to be introducing cousin matching in the next month or two. And they've got some very, very nifty uh, software algorithms and programs that are going to change the way we think about managing our autosomal DNA matches. So watch this space. But like I said, the nature of matches is that most of your matches will be distant matches. And of the 1,914 matches that I have at Family Tree DNA, I am only going to concentrate on the top 10%. So that's only 191 matches. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a sizable number of matches. But these are the ones that are second cousins, third cousins, maybe some fourth cousins there. And these are the ones that I have a hope of finding where the connection lies. Because in Irish family trees, the records tend to run out around about 1800. How many people has a, have a brick wall in their Irish research between 1800 and 1850? You know, that'll be the majority of people. How many people have been able to get back into the 1700s on their Irish research? A handful of people. You know, so it is difficult with Irish research, and DNA can certainly help point you in the right direction. So the step-by-step -step approach that I use is I try to keep it as simple as possible. It's only four simple steps. And um, there's nothing really simple about them. But I'll try and make them as simple as possible. Step one is where does the common ancestor sit? Step two is, is the common ancestor obvious? Step three is, uh, let's eliminate non-contenders so we can focus on who would be the contenders for the common ancestor. And step four is triangulation or working in small groups. So we'll cover each of these steps in turn. The, the shortcut and the great thing about this approach is you don't need to follow it at all. You don't need to know anything about the technicalities of DNA in order to get the maximum amount out of it. Because at the end of the day, the DNA is just pointing you to somebody to whom you are related, and you can just send them your pedigree and say, whatever the, you know, we're a DNA match, but I don't know anything about DNA, here's my pedigree. Do you see any common locations, common surnames, common individuals? Because if you don't, then we're kind of back to square one, because there's nothing that we can work on. And this is why I think DNA is so good. You do not need to know about the technicalities to actually get really good benefit from DNA testing. 
So, and you can write this out in a pen and paper, you can write it out in an Excel spreadsheet, whatever way you want to do it, as long as you can attach it to an email and send it to people and say, here's my pedigree, what do you think? And that's the basis for the start of collaboration. But in order to get to that place where you have a, 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 a pedigree that is as comprehensive as, as, as is reasonably possible, you need to be able to characterize each brick wall in your family tree. And with Irish research in particular, this means identifying the most distant known ancestor and using things like who were the witnesses and the sponsors at the baptisms of the children of the couple you're brick walled at. Because they could possibly be brothers and sisters of that married couple. Um, and you need to put them into your family tree with a big question mark at the beginning, at the end of, the, of the, the name, so that people aren't copying it as gospel into their tree. Uh, but look at the baptisms of, the, of their children, because uh, naming convention, and I'm not sure if it's on the next slide, no it's not, but Irish naming convention is, the first child is named after the father's father. Second, second son after the, father, after the mother's father, the third son after the father, the fourth son after the father's eldest brother, and the fifth son after the mother's eldest brother. Now it's slightly different for Scottish naming convention, but that is Irish naming convention. The, the girls are, are very, very similar. The first daughter named after the mother's mother, second daughter after the father's mother, third daughter after the mother, fourth daughter after the mother's eldest sister, fifth daughter after the father's eldest sister. Unless, of course, you have a child who dies. And a child who dies, the next child that comes along takes the name of the child that just died. And if that child dies, then you turn the back of your hand to the ancestors. And you pick a name that is totally unrelated to the family to break the bad luck of that particular name. And that's why sometimes in your family you find Timothy. But we never had any of the Timothys anywhere in the family. Why is Timothy suddenly appearing there? Because it's to break the cycle of bad luck associated with two children dying with the same name. Fascinating custom. Uh, naming convention, very common in the early 1800s up to the late 1800s. Um, but a lot of families adapted it to suit their own needs. In my own Gleason family, uh, there were three John Gleasons, and when it came to John, they just skipped that name and went on to the next one. Uh, so naming con convention can be very, very useful, which is why you need to know uh, the names of the children, the order in which they were born, and also look to see who their godparents were, uh, because that can be, uh, give you a clue to brothers and sisters of the married couple, uh, which may also be consistent with the naming convention that that couple are using to name their children. And that's how you build out a possible generation above your brick wall. So step one in this step-by-step -step process, where does the common ancestor sit? And it's all about positioning your common ancestor on the family tree. And there's no DNA technical uh, aspects involved here. It's all about genealogy. So for example, if the match comes back and says, oh, you've got a third cousin match, well, a third cousin for me means that it's my great, great grandparent uh, is the common ancestor. And my great, great grandparents were born about 1835. So immediately, I'm actually placing the common ancestor in a historical time frame. And I'm thinking 1835. OK, that's before civil registration. So civil records are not going to be make, uh, I'm not going to be able to use them at all. So I'm relying on church records. And hopefully, the church records are available for the area in question. And I'm planning my documentary-based research on the basis of where the common ancestor is likely to sit in the family tree. Uh, I'm also narrowing it down to 16 great-great-grandparents. But of course, they were usually married to each other. Uh, so that's actually eight great-great-grandparental couples. So I'm looking for eight couples. And it could be either one of those eight couples. If I have a fifth cousin match, on the other hand, that's taking me back to 1765. What are the chances of finding a common ancestor in Irish records in 1765? Minimal. 
So again, my, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'd, probably my time is better spent looking at the third cousin than the fifth cousin, because there simply aren't records going back that far. Um, one of the most important uh, advances in recent years has been the shared Santa Morgan project developed by Blaine Bettinger. And what he did was he looked at a total of more than 25,000 known relationships. First cousins, second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins. And he collected the amount of DNA shared for each of those relationships and he put them into tables and spreadsheets. So here's a nice table at the beginning of this um, PDF version that you can download from the uh, link here. And it shows yourself, your sibling, your half-sibling, all the various relationships that you might have. He also puts it into a wonderful uh, table, showing you the average amount of DNA shared for a variety of different relationships, uh, the minimum amount, and the maximum amount as well. So you can see from this whether, you know, if somebody has you know, if somebody is a, say, first cousin once removed, could they possibly be sharing 900 centimorgans of DNA? Well, according to this, the maximum has, that's been observed is 851, so it's highly unlikely. So by using these charts and using these diagrams, you can get a really good feel for what the likely relationship is going to be. Here's an example of grandparents. You can see that the average amount of DNA shared uh, with your grandparents is 25%. And that falls in the, uh, uh, the realm of 1,766 uh, centimorgans, centimorgan being the unit of measurement for DNA. And there is 1,766 somewhere within this block here. And you can see that it's kind of halfway in the middle of this curve. But some people will be sharing only 19% of their DNA with a particular grandparent, and some people will be sharing 30% of their DNA with a particular grandparent. Maybe that's why you always liked Granny. <laughs> because you had more of her DNA than, than, than the other grandparents. You know, so these are the kind of considerations you need to take into account. Similarly, if we look at second cousins once removed, you can see that the average is 123. It's a skew curve rather than a normal distribution, but there is a range around that average. So even though there is an average, there is a range, and you have to be aware of that range because most of the time, most people will be around the average, but some people are going to be outliers. And that can really throw a spanner in the works when you come to predicting where they sit in the family tree. It's made a little bit easier for us by DNA Painter, which is a wonderful program developed by Johnny Pearl, where you actually type in the amount of DNA that you share with a match, and it gives you percentages for what's the probability it's within this cluster, uh, within this cluster, within this cluster. And you can see here that if you share 232 centimorgans with somebody, there's a 55% chance it's going to be one of these relations here, probably a second cousin, because most of us are more likely to have second cousins than half great grand nieces and nephews. So, but it is somewhere in that cluster. Um, a lot of the time, if there is uh, endogamy in a particular population, then the connection is further back than it seems. So Ashkenazi Jews, Romani Gypsies, Hindu castes, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Polynesians, uh, New Zealand, Maori, um, South Sea Islanders, uh, Hawaii, Hawaiian citizens, they are a very endogamous population. And of course, um, in Ireland, anyone from a small, isolated, rural community, which is everybody in Ireland, really. So, um, <laughs> you know, the, the further back you go, the higher the likelihood there's a double connection within your family. And if there's a double connection, then the whole transmission of DNA and where it came from can get very, very confusing. And it may mean that uh, distant cousins look closer than they actually are because they're a second cousin on one line and a third cousin on two other lines, meaning they're kind of heavy with DNA and it makes them look closer than they actually are. So that's the first step. Where does the common ancestor sit? And it means looking at the DNA and trying to predict from the amount of DNA where they're likely to sit in your family tree relative to you. 
The second step is, is the common ancestor obvious? And again, this doesn't involve the technicalities of DNA at all. It's simply a question of sharing your family trees and comparing the family trees together. Um, here is uh, ancestry, and you can see that this person here has no family tree, but if we click on uh, the view match, you'll see here that it says select a tree to preview, and if we click on select a tree to preview, it says the Kyver family tree is there. So why did it say no family tree at the beginning? Because the DNA is not linked to their family tree. Because they haven't done so, you have to do that manually. And if that is not, hasn't been done, then the message comes up as no family tree. It should really be no linked family tree. Um, so even though it says no family tree, do be aware and do go looking for a family tree because there may be one there in your ancestry results for this particular person. Now, uh, here is the family tree, and you can see that there are quite a few people in it. Interestingly, though, it's only on the maternal side of the family and not on the paternal side. I'm also assuming that the person in this family tree is the same person that did the test. So not it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's the spouse that has done the test. So you just have to be very careful that the home person doesn't always equate with the person who did the DNA test. Finding other people's trees. Well, on family tree DNA, this little icon here indicates that a family tree is present. Um, they also have a list of ancestors, which can be quite useful on family tree DNA. But my dad has only got 355 matches, I and mean, he has a little bit more than that. But of those 355, only 66% had uh, some surnames, and only 20% had trees. And this is a major problem with DNA testing, is that a lot of people who do the DNA test do not give you a link to their family tree. And that can be really problematic, because DNA in isolation is just DNA. It doesn't tell you anything about the family tree of the person that you match. And you need to have that family tree in order to find out where you connect with that person. So my dad now has 1185, and the statistics are still the same. Uh, so if there is no tree, then how do you go about finding one? And there's a variety of different techniques that I've used successfully with varying degrees of success over the years. Um, here, I'll just show you here on uh, Family Tree DNA, if you click on the match and click on my name, it comes up with my profile, which has my email address. It also has my most distant ancestors. These are things that I can use to find my family tree online. I simply do a Google search using the word genealogy, colon, and then, for example, I could put my name in. I could put genealogy, colon, Morris John Gleason, and it may very well come up with my tree. I could put in genealogy, colon, and then the email address, morrisgleason at doctors.org.uk, and you might find that I've actually made a comment on a genealogy forum and that there is a link on that forum to my family tree. And that could be on genealogy, it could be on genie, it could be on wiki, it could be on any of these genealogy websites. So it's very useful to do a Google search just with the word genealogy, colon, and then the person's name, username, or email address. Frequently the username is actually just the first part of the email address. So it's a very useful way of, of finding a family tree. And that tree could be on Ancestry, MyHeritage, RootsWeb, Genes Reunited, WikiTree, Genie, and so on and so on. There's lots of uh, websites where you may find a link to a family tree. So it's always worthwhile looking for that. If you can't find a tree, and as a last resort, you could try contacting your match. And the reason I say it's the last resort is because a lot of them don't reply. And when you're there at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're burning to get this one piece of information and you need them to reply now and they're totally unreasonable being asleep at this hour, uh, you want to get an immediate answer. And that's why I prefer looking for it myself rather than sending a, an email off and then five weeks later getting a response and thinking, I have no idea why I wrote to this person in the first place. <laughs> so. 
uh, many people don't reply. Many people don't reply. Or if they do, it's six months later, you know, I don't come on here very frequently. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's good if you can f have a tactic for actually finding the information yourself. So that's step two, is the common ancestor obvious? And for that, you need to compare your tree with somebody else's tree. Step three is about eliminating your ancestors, getting rid of your ancestors, getting rid of the ancestors that couldn't possibly be related to, um, uh, couldn't be the connection to your match. And there's a variety of ways that you can actually eliminate uh, non-contenders. Uh, ethnicity, nationality, and geography is a very useful one. Uh, a match on the Y DNA or mitochondrial DNA can help as well. A match on the X chromosome can be very, very useful when it occurs and is not very frequent. Trying to distinguish between which of your matches are on your mother's side and which of your matches are on your father's side of the family is very, very useful if you can do it. And um, we'll take a look at that. Uh, we can also narrow it down to a specific common ancestral couple. So if you want to focus on a particular brick wall in your family tree, then focusing down on that particular couple can be a very useful way of eliminating everybody, uh, all, all the matches that are not connected via that couple. And then we'll talk uh, very briefly about phasing your DNA and chromosome mapping, which can be a very useful technique, very time intensive, but if you're really into DNA, then that's something you can get involved in. And this step for the first time involves looking at the technicalities of DNA. Everything up till now, you don't need to know anything about DNA to get benefit from doing the test. The goal here is to discard as many of your ancestors who could not possibly be the common ancestor with your match. And here is uh, my pack of tarot cards, because I, I, do, um, I do readings on the side if you're interested. So. <laughs> And they have uh, numbers that go up to 15, which is why I uh, choose them. And we're using Annan Taffel numbers here. Your number one, your father's number two, your mother's number three. Uh, grandparents are four, five, six, seven. Great grandparents, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. I love Annan Taffel numbers because it allows me to say that men are even and women are odd. <laughs> <coughs> I think I just about got away with that one. Um, and it's a very interesting way of, of locating people within the tree. Uh, fathers are twice the number of the, the, um, the child, and mothers are twice plus one the number of the child. So you can find anybody in the tree just using these wonderful Annan Taffel numbers. And the idea is, if you can uh, detect which are your maternal matches, which are your paternal matches, you've immediately discarded 50% of your ancestors as non-contenders for the match with your cousin. If you can twiddle it down and find a match on the X chromosome, you can discard even more ancestors. If there's an improbable ethnicity among your match's uh, ancestors, you can say, well, it's definitely not on their Japanese side. And if you can whittle it down to a specific grandparent, then you're actually left with only uh, one ancestral line, potentially, along which the DNA has been passed uh, down to you and al along which you will find the common ancestor with your match. So that's the whole uh, process on, uh, with regard to step three, trying to get rid of your ancestors and whittle down the contenders. So if you look at ethnicity, nationality, and geography of your ancestors, supposing in, in my uh, ancestry I have uh, one grandparent is Irish, another one is Japanese, another one is African, another one is English, and I get a match, and it's uh, somebody who has four grandparents, all from Africa. Well, then I can say, well, probably you're related to me on my mother's father's side because he was African. You know, the same with, you know, if you match somebody and they're three quarters Japanese and one quarter Irish, well, then it's probably on my father's father's side because he was Irish. So you can whittle down the uh, contenders using that um, methodology. Same with nationality as well. You know, if you've got somebody who um, matches you and they have U.S. colonial ancestry that goes back to the 1600s and you only have one line that actually goes that far and the rest of your ancestors are German and French and Belgian, then you can say, well, in all likelihood, it's on my U.S. colonial line because my match only has U.S. colonial. So it has to be through that particular line. Similarly, why transmission? So for example, Y is passed down along the father, father, father line. If your match 
If you've done a Y DNA test, and so has your match, and you don't match on the Y DNA, then you can say that in all likelihood, we are not collect connected on my father, father, father line going up, and on your father, father, father line going up, we can eliminate that line from further consideration. And the, similarly with mitochondrial DNA, if you've done the mitochondrial DNA test and the other person has done the mitochondrial DNA test and there's no match between you, then the connection cannot be on your mother, mother, mother line going up meeting his mother, mother, mother line going up. So that's a way of using mitochondrial DNA to get rid of a, a particular ancestral path down which it could not have been transmitted. xDNA has a particular uh, mode of inheritance uh, the X here is for a male, and it's, uh, the X chromosome is in green. This is the pathway, because remember, you get her, uh, your X chromosome from uh, your mother and your father if you're a woman, but if you're a man, you get your X chromosome from your mother, and you get your Y chromosome from your father. So uh, there's always a block when you come to a male in terms of X chromosome transmission. So there's no, that male there could not have passed X chromosome down to this, his son. Similarly, uh, this male up here could not have passed X chromosome down to his son. It would have been Y chromosome. And it, it means that you can, if you do have a match on the X, and I'll just show you the chart, if you're a man, your X match could only be via your maternal side. So if you've got a substantial segment of DNA on your X chromosome, say 25 or 30 centimorgans, that can only have come via your mother's side of the family. So essentially, you've eliminated, eliminated all of your father's side, that's 50% of your ancestors, and a sizable number of ancestors on your maternal side down through which the X chromosome could not have passed. So we're whittling down, whittling down, whittling down the number of contenders for the common ancestor between you and your match. If I test my dad, and I have done so, anyone who matches me and my dad has to be related on my dad's side of the family. That's fairly obvious. But anyone who matches me and not my dad has to be related on my mother's side of the family, just by a process of simple elimination. So that's why it's very, very useful if you can test a parent. If you don't have a parent available, then maybe test one of your first cousins on your paternal side, anyone who matches you and your paternal first cousin is going to be related to you on your father's side of the family. Similarly, you can test a, a, a maternal first cousin, and anyone who matches you and your maternal first cousin has to be related on your mother's side of the family, barring one of these second connections that we have talked about previously. So it's a useful technique of actually eliminating half of your ancestors. The last thing, phasing, is actually quite involved, but GetMatch makes it easier for us because if you have tested a parent, you can upload yourself and your parents' DNA into GetMatch, and what they will do is they will phase the DNA um, and I'll give you a, a readout of your phased DNA. Now, what's meant by phased DNA? When the machine is comparing your DNA to somebody else's DNA, it compares your two copies of chromosome one with your matches two copies of chromosome one. And it's not able to distinguish between which is your maternal copy and your paternal copy and which is your matches maternal and paternal copy. So you're actually comparing two copies versus two copies. With phasing, what phasing does is it reduces it to just one copy on your side. Hopefully, if your match has done phasing, there'll be one copy on their side as well. So you're either comparing one paternal versus one maternal, or one maternal versus one maternal, or one um, uh, maternal copy on your side and either a paternal or maternal copy on the other side. And it just makes it much more concise. It, it removes a lot of the false positives, and it means that you have a much cleaner comparison between the two people involved. And there's various ways of phasing your DNA. It is very involved. It's very time consuming. Uh, visual phasing uh, has been introduced in a series of blog posts by Blaine Bettinger. Uh, but it does take up a huge amount of time. 
Uh, but once you've done it, it can actually be very, very helpful. And it's very similar to um, DNA painting, which is not something that I'm going to get into, but it's something we mentioned earlier on this morning. There's lots of information on Blaine's uh, websites about how to do this type of phasing, and uh, uh, Johnny Pearl has produced a DNA painter as well, uh, which again can help you allocate specific segments to specific ancestors. And that can actually help when you're dealing with large numbers of matches. So at the end of step three, we've used a variety of fairly technical approaches to uh, eliminate non-contenders from consideration. The most useful, I find, are being able to separate maternal from paternal, um, narrowing down to a specific common ancestral couple by testing specific ancestors, and we'll see uh, specific descendants, actually, specific cousins from that uh, shared ancestor. Uh, ethnicity and nationality and geography are actually quite useful, so do look at where your matches ancestral lines come from, because that can say, well, there's no way that I've got anybody in Belgium, so it can't be on that line. So it allows you to eliminate in that way. And then a match on the X can be very useful if it's substantial, and by substantial I mean more than 20 centimorgans, and if, um, and if it occurs, because they are relatively rare at that level. The fourth step is triangulation, and that's working in uh, small groups. And it's about identifying groups who are likely to share the same common ancestor. And a, th this triangulation methodology has really, it's been around for a long time. In trigonometry and in geometry, they've used triangulation. Here you can see them on one bank of the river, and they're trying to see how far away is this tree in the distance. And they're just simply using angles and the distance between them to estimate how far away this tree is on the other bank of the river. And what we're doing with DNA is we are standing here, living descendants of a common ancestor, and we're just looking back into the past to see where we triangulate on a common ancestor. So it's a very similar kind of technique. And I did it with my family. And there is me down here. Here is my, my siblings, uh, my father. And a few years ago, I realized that my father, ha who descends from Patrick Spearan and Mary Morgan, there, there is my great-great-great-great-grandparents up there, uh, around about 1800, um, I realized that several of our family members had actually descended from the same couple. And I thought, well, surely I can do that, something with this. I, uh, they all descend from Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan. Now, what could I possibly do to use the information? And you can see how they're all nicely triangulating on that couple. You see the nice triangles there in the diagram. And what I did was, I compared all four of them. So let's call them A, B, C, and D. I compared uh, A with B, A with C, A with D, looking for the matches that they shared. Uh, so A and B shared 53 matches, A and C shared 17, A and D shared 13, and then I compared, compared B with C, B with D, and C with D. So pairwise comparisons. And I put it all to an, into an Excel spreadsheet, and I removed the duplicates, and I was left with 100 matches that were shared by at least two of any of the four cousins on my side of the family. And the idea here was if the, the shared matches had DNA that they shared with any two of these four cousins, but the DNA must have come down to us through Patrick Spearin and Mary Morgan. So I'm triangulating now on a particular brick wall in my family tree. And what I did was I sent 100 personal emails to all 100 of these shared matches, asking the simple question, do you have any Spiran ancestors? Do you have any Morgan ancestors? And 49 responses came back saying, no, 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 no. The 50th response said yes. I said, oh, is it Spiran? Because I'm really interested in the Spiran side. And they said, no, it's Morgan. I said, oh, OK, well, never mind. Um, tell me about him. 
So well, it's John Morgan is his name. Oh, okay. And how do you know that? Well, because of this gravestone. Uh, because on the gravestone it says, erected by John Morgan in fond remembrance of his dearly beloved wife, Mary, who died in 1879, age 78. And all those people down below, yeah, those are all my immediate family, so they're buried in the same grave as John Morgan. So I said, oh, well, send me your tree. Uh, you do have an online link. They said, oh, no, we haven't started it yet. <laughs> so guess who built their family tree for them? <laughs> So I spent several months building this family tree for the Morgans, and for the life of me, I could not find out where was the connection between their John Morgan, born around about 1800, and my Mary Morgan, born around about 1800. Were they brother and sister? Were they first cousins? I didn't know. So it went into the shoebox, it went under the bed, and then two years later, I got the 51st response. And this was a new DNA match. You have to persevere with DNA. You know, it might be two years before you get the answer to the question you've been asking. So this new DNA match had another Morgan ancestor. This one was Patrick Morgan. He even had a photograph of him in his Royal Irish Constabulary finery. And the, uh, the sword that you see here is, has now been polished and is hanging on a wall in Dublin. So the family got a, took a real reinterest in this part of the family tree. And he was born in about 1812, so kind of around about the 1800 time mark that my Mary and the other person's John Morgan were born. There were rumors in the family of a link to Wales. Well, yeah, Morgan is a Welsh name. Can also be native Irish, so I was never sure whether it was native Irish or Welsh. So I took out the shoebox, I had to crawl under the bed and, you know, spiders and cobwebs and took out the shoebox, found a tree online. Now, how I missed it the first time, I don't know. But I took out all the research, was Googling, and then I found a tree online. And this was the tree. It was on Genie. Maybe Genie wasn't around. Maybe I didn't think of Genie the last time. But I found this tree, and I'm looking down, and I think, oh, look, there's Patrick Morgan. Oh, they've got parents for him. Oh, won't they be pleased? They've been able to push back their Morgans an extra generation. Um, and then I looked along, and I thought, uh, oh, John Morgan, is he the guy in the gravestone that uh, the first chap uh, uh, told me about. And he's married to a Mary. That could be the Mary Morgan. And then I fell off my chair because there are my great, great, great grandparents. I thought, what the heck? You know, so I said, well, let me have a look at the sources. There are no sources. <laughs> so, okay, when was this tree put up? It was put up in 2013. So, okay, 2013, five years ago. Uh, the, you do, uh, this, I'm not going to get any reply from an email, so in a, um, I was very, I was kind of annoyed at the time, because it was two o'clock in the morning and I wanted the answer now. So I just contacted the o o owner and I said, why do you have my great-great-grandparents in your tree, yours sincerely? And, <laughs> and I thought, well, that's the end of that. I'm not going to hear from them for another two years or so. Three days later, I get an answer. Because I have Professor Wardell's notebooks from 1906. Uh, excuse me? Uh, who was Professor Wardell? He was Professor of Military History, Trinity College, Dublin, at the turn of the century and in the early 1900s. He did an all-Ireland survey of the, no the Morgan surname using the wills and all of the documents in the public record office that were blown up in 1922, and he made notes of them in his notebook. Not only that, but he also based a lot of his work on the previous genealogist, uh, Mr. Blacker, back in the 1800s, who also did a very intense survey of the Morgan surname in Ireland. And here are the notes from Professor Wardell, and there are my great-great-grandparents in the middle of his notes with their parents, Edward and Jane Dwyer, and also the Patrick Morgan, the RIC officer, and the John Morgan from the gravestone in Limerick. Uh, they also give me the date, the uh, place of birth of my great-great-great-grandfather, Patrick Spearn of Kappa, Ballangarry, County Limerick. I never knew this. But not only that, um, <laughs> They gave me five generations of Morgans going back to Limerick in the early 1600s. They also gave me the link to the, the Morgans of Tredegar in Wales, who are descended from Noah, <laughs> five kings, six lords, and a duck. I think it's a duke, but it could be a duck. You never know. 
Um, and also, descend, also descended from these Morgans of Tredegar are uh, somebody called J.P. Morgan and somebody called Princess Diana. And here is her line of descent from William Morgan of Tredegar, 1571. So it looks like I am the 11th cousin of Princess Diana just because I triangulated with four of my cousins onto my Morgan Spearin ancestors. So I've been telling this story to, well, anybody who would listen to it, really. <laughs> and um, I was at the Irish Georgian Society St. Patrick's Day party, and I'm talking to the lady beside me, Caroline, and she's a little bit uh, talky, so I thought, I better get my story in first. And I thought, so I, you know, I might, be I might be invited to the royal wedding in May, I joked. And she said, well, that's a coincidence, because I'm going, and I've got a spare ticket. <laughs> So I am falling off my chair on multiple occasions. Um, but then she points out, oh, of course, you can't go because you're on your tour of Australia, aren't you? Damn. <laughs> so I almost got invited to the royal wedding. So that's an excellent illustration of the crazy, crazy, crazy adventures that DNA can take you on. Now, of course, all of this needs to be fact-checked. And what I basically have inherited now is years and years of work double-checking the facts of Professor Wardell, uh, John Blacker from the 1850s, and this link to Wales and the Morgans of Tredegar. But I'm trying to shortcut it because I've got one of my Morgan cousins to do the Y-DNA test, and we're going to be focusing now on trying to establish that the Morgans of Tredegar are actually related to the Morgans of Limerick, and therefore that will add confirmatory evidence to this wonderful story. <laughs> Um, and my dad always says to me, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story, do you? <laughs> so um, so that's, that's that story, and it just illustrates how triangulation can have some really kind of shocking effects. You do have to be careful with triangulation because obviously I'm aiming at a particular ancestral couple. I don't know if I have a second connection to Princess Diana or J.P. Morgan or one of these other people. And that's a real way to ruin a good party is the spanner in the works, um, a fly in the ointment. You do have to be very careful about that. But to summarize step four, triangulation means different things to different people. And you have to be careful about how you use the term. It can be effective without getting into technicalities. It can be confirmed uh, by searching for overlapping segments and uh, uh, that gets into, again, more technicalities that I'm not going to talk about. Um, the documentary evidence of a connection is good, but it does not confirm the DNA was transmitted to all the shared matches by the common ancestor in question. If there's a second connection, usually you don't know about it, unless you've done your entire tree all the way back and excluded it. So you do have to be careful about assuming that just because you have a match with somebody that it's via a particular ancestral line. But there's ways of getting around it, and I'm not going to go into that uh, at, uh, today. But that gives you a, a summary of um, triangulation and the four steps involved in a step-by-step -step approach to your DNA matches. I'm going to leave you with a slide that says tools, 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 uh, which are a variety of different tools that you can use if you want to get deeper into this whole um, system of analyzing and managing your matches. But uh, hopefully I've given you enough uh, preliminary information to show you that uh, you can actually use your DNA to good effect without really getting too deeply into the technicalities of what DNA and genetics is all about. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So we, we have time for a few questions, so we'll take a question here from the front. Oh, I know. That's why I'm recording this so that you actually can see it. Actually, Greg, are we finishing at 15? We're finishing at the next one is on at 3. All oh, right, the next one is on 3.45. So we have a few time, a few qu minutes for questions. Oh, right, okay, cool. Fine, so... Um, There, there are some really good books out there, and one of the best ones is by Blaine Bettinger, 
Um, so uh, I can't remember the title of his book. Do you remember? Has anybody read uh, Blaine's Blaine's title of his book? Uh, but if you if you search for Blaine Bettinger, it, and it's genetic genealogy. So just search for Blaine Bettinger on Amazon, okay. and you'll see his book. He it's. I think it's really easy because Blaine is a very kind of uh, practical, uh, easy uh, to understand, he uses easy to understand language. So I think it's, and he's got a workbook as well so you can actually practice with some of the examples, yeah. Copies upstairs. Oh, there's copies upstairs, yes. So have a look. The triangulation would help you, but what you'd have to do is you'd have to test several of your cousins to see which ancestral line you're connected on. Okay, a couple of my cousins are already on. Okay, do you know if she connects to you via your paternal or maternal side? Yeah. So it's definitely a maternal match, so we're narrowing it down. Then can you get a second cousin to test to see if it's via one of your, grand, uh, one of your great grandparents? Okay. You know, and by that way, you know, you might be able to narrow down which ancestral couple the DNA is likely to have to come through on your side, get her to do the same to find out which ancestral line it's trickled down to her on her side, and that way you might be able to find your own Professor Wardell with his notebooks from 1906. Uh, let's take this lady over here. Um, I found my, my Irish Morgans were Dunmoylan and Old Abbey in County Limerick, and the Morgans of Tredegar are near Newport and Wells. Lady in the pink? I had someone contact me on Ancestry DNA with Don T. Yep. Sure. Uh, so the question is, I found an adoptee who matches my, uh, your father, is on your father's side of the family. So how, how can you work with adoptees? There's, there's a lot of information out on the, uh, you know, if you Google adoptees DNA, there's a lot of information there. There's some YouTube videos which are quite useful as well. Um, what you would do is you would look at the matches that you share with this adoptee and try and narrow it down um, to, to where the adoptee fits into the larger family. Um, you will need access to the family trees of all the shared matches you have with the adoptee and it'll take a little bit of detective work, by which I mean a lot of detective work and genealogy work and staying up till two o'clock in the morning to build a tree and then finding where to place that adoptee. And there's a really good tool that has just come out by uh, Johnny Pearl, Leela Pearl Larkin, Andrew Millard called Watto, or What Are the Odds? And the Watto tool allows you to build a family tree and then you can insert the adoptee in various places in the tree and it will tell you what are the odds that position one is correct, what are the odds that position two is correct, position three, position four. So Watto, W-A-T-O, if you Google that, that's a very useful way of using mathematics and statistics to give you an odds of what is the most likely hypothesis given the data that you've fed into the system. Question here at the back. If you have 6% Eastern European Jewish on your ethnic makeup, there are several caveats. Number one, take it with a very big pinch of salt. Um, it's just broad brushstrokes. Uh, this morning I was telling people that I was 20% British until April. And then I lost my 20% British and now I'm 100% Irish. So that's why my accent is so much stronger now than it was earlier in the year. You know. um, so you do have to take this with, you know, big, they're just, they're just painting big broad, uh, broad brush strokes. You have to take it with a pinch of salt. You may be Jewish, you may not be Jewish. Um, it's not going to identify which of your ancestors was Jewish. 
and you cannot be sure that the 6% came from just the one ancestor. It could have been two ancestors were Jewish and they gave you 3% each, or 2% and 4%. So it doesn't tell you a huge amount except it's like, it's a clue. Uh, and it's like playing one of those murder mysteries where you get a small insight into something but it doesn't paint the whole picture. Uh, no, I mean, if, if it's 6%, then so for example, okay, if you were 50% Jewish, I'd say one of your parents was Jewish. If you're 25% Jewish, I'd say one of your grandparents or maybe two of your great-grandparents was Jewish. If you're 6%, I'd say it is going to be one of your great-great, and I got that right, 50, 25, 12 and a half, yeah, great-great. So it's going to be one of your great-great-grandparents may have been Jewish, is what it's suggesting to me. But I'm very happy to be proven wrong on that. And I would say that you know, there's an 80% chance that, you know, I wouldn't even go that far. I'd say maybe there's a 60% chance that that is the correct hypothesis. But hypothesis number two is that two of your great-great-great-grandparents were Jewish. And that's maybe a 20% probability. But there's other possibilities as well that it's a false positive and you're not Jewish at all. A uh, lady here? Oh, my grandparents are first cousins. Okay. <laughs> Just like Charles Darwin and his wife. Oh, yeah. Um, it messes up your ability to figure out what's going on. Uh, <laughs> because you, you ha it, you, that's when the gymnastics comes in, you know, and you're doing these mental gymnastics. Okay, well, he's related to her and she's related to him. So, if, you know, so you do have to do a lot more mapping of the potential relationships, and that's where the pen and paper comes in handy, and you do your doodles beside the computer. Um, if it's a, if the first cousin marrying first cousin, then a lot of the relations that they have, you have to take uh, the, you have to add the, the DNA that you are expecting for that relationship on top of the other, the DNA that you'd expect for the other relationship. So if the two first cousins are related to a third cousin, for example, well, then it may be I'm that person's third cousin via that line, and I'm also that cursed person's third cousin, third cousin by another line. The average amount I'd expect for a third cousin is 80 centimorgans, but because it's a double connection, I double that to 160 centimorgans. Okay, now I've got it in my head. Does that make sense from what I'm seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, question here. Congratulations, congratulations. It does work, it does work, and adoptees are turning to DNA to uh, bypass a lot of the lack of, lack of uh, documentary research. Even birth mothers. I am working with a 78-year-old birth mother and an 81-year-old birth mother from Ireland. Um, both of them gave birth 60 years ago to a child. Uh, they were taken in, they were pregnant, they were put to sleep, they woke up, the pregnancy was gone, the child was gone. They don't even know if it was a boy or a girl. So they are now trying to find that child by having their DNA, and even if they pass away before the child is found or the grandchildren are found, the DNA is leaving a very clear message, I came looking for you. Yeah. Very important, very important. We better end it there. Uh, I'll be around at the back in case anybody wants to talk to me. Thank you very much. Everyone, coffee, tea, and beverages are being served upstairs outside the ballroom. So, FYI, yep. Thanks. Thanks. It's a, it's a thing. It is. It is. It is. But it's so fast.